we need a lemma, which is a form of the superposition principle. That says, if x1, x2, through xk solve x dot equals ax, this represents the general homogeneous linear system, then c1, x1 plus c2, x2 plus CK, XK is a solution for any constants C1, C2 through CK. The proof is elementary. You simply substitute this expression into the differential equation and distribute the derivative across the sum and also the matrix across the sum. As an example, consider the differential equation uh, 4251, x dot equals 4251 all times x. On step one, we find the eigenvalues. To find the eigenvalues, we subtract lambda from the diagonal elements and calculate the determinant. This gives us 4 minus lambda times 1 minus lambda minus 10. Go this way and then subtract the product the other way. Boiling this expression out, we'll have a positive lambda squared. A negative 4 lambda minus lambda is negative 5 lambda. Then a positive 4 minus 10 is minus 6. This factors nicely as lambda minus 6, lambda plus 1. They have to have opposite signs and add up to negative 5. And hence, we have the eigenvalues negative 1 and 6. To solve for the eigenvectors, recall that we have to solve a minus lambda i 0 by Gaussian elimination. Subtracting lambda i amounts to subtracting lambda from the diagonal element. So for lambda equals negative 1, subtracting negative 1 from the diagonal elements means adding 1 to the diagonal elements. We get 5, 2, 5, 2, 0, 0. Note, you always end up with the ability to use elementary row operations to reduce the second row to a row of zeros. So in actual practice for a 2 by 2 system like this, you never have to write the second row. Then, this equation represents 5x plus 2y equals 0, which has solution x equals 2, y equals negative 5, illustrating you can switch the coefficients and change the sign on 1, giving us eigenvectors of the form constants times 2, negative 5. We only need one, though. We can choose c equals 1 in constructing our solution. We have a solution, x1. Remember, they're of the form e to the lambda t times v, where v is an eigenvector and lambda is an eigenvalue. This gives us e to the minus t times 2, negative 5. And oops, this is going to be one of our solutions. So far, we have that lambda equals negative 1 gives us v equals 2, negative 5, and hence one solution is e to the minus t, 2, negative 5. We now need to deal with the lambda equals 6 case. Subtracting 6 from the diagonal elements gives us negative 2, 2, and note, I don't even need to write the second row. 
Keep in mind, I could write v2 equals 2, 2, switching these two and switching the sign on 1, but even better, solving the same equation, I can choose it to be 1, 1. That will solve this equation as well. And that gives me a second solution, x2 equals e to the 6t times 1, 1. We now have these two functions as solutions to the linear system. It follows from the, from the lemma that c1, e to the negative t, 2, negative 5, plus c2, e to the 6t, 1, 1, is also a solution for any constants c1 and c2. So far in the development of our theory, we don't know that all solutions are in this list. They will be, but we need to prove that. Also note that we have two constants of integration. The vector x has two coordinates, x and y. We expect that we get one constant of integration from each coordinate. So we're expecting the solution set to have two arbitrary parameters. And in fact, this solution set does. You might also be wondering what these solutions look like. And to figure that out, you need to rewrite this as 2c1 e to the negative t plus c2 e to the 6t and then negative 5c1 e to the negative t plus c2 e to the 6t. So the x-coordinate of the solution will be equal to this function and the y-coordinate equal to this function. What the solution looks like will depend upon the values of c1 and c2. If we were to draw the solution on some xy coordinate axes, notice that the vector 1, 1 is a vector in this direction. I'm going to put a line that goes in this direction. And also the vector 2, negative 5 goes in this direction. I'm going to put a line in that direction as well. It needs to go in both directions because the constants c could be negative, and so it could be in the opposite direction. Now, in the direction of 2, negative 5, the solution will decay exponentially, which means, in fact, the solutions go this way, in towards the origin. If c2 is 0, solutions along this line will exponentially decay to the origin. If c1 is 0 and c2 is not 0, solutions will exponentially grow in the other eigen, eigenvector direction. If you're not exactly on one of these axes, the solution will do something like this. It will decay in in one direction and, it, and uh, then exponentially grow out in the other direction. Coming in this way and out the other. So it, which solution curve you take depends upon the initial data that you choose. If you choose some point here, your solution will start here and then go out this way. I've already used the word eigenspace. Let me define that word. The eigenspace, and it's denoted by E with a subscript of lambda, associated with the eigenvalue lambda is the set of all solutions to the equation AV equals lambda V. Now, this includes one vector more than the set of all eigen vectors associated with the eigenvalue lambda. And in particular, it includes the vector zero, which we've specifically said is not an eigenvector. So the 
eigenspace E lambda includes all eigenvectors associated with the eigenvalue lambda, but it also includes the zero vector. And that inclusion of the zero vector makes the eigenspace into a subspace of Rn, the space on which the matrix A acts. There are certain matrices for which it is trivial to find the eigenvalues. In particular, any matrix that is diagonal, upper triangular, or lower triangular, the eigenvalues appear exactly on the diagonal. Let me give you an example. Suppose I have the matrix 2, 1, 0, 3. This matrix is called upper triangular. And if we try to find the eigenvalues, we subtract two from the diagonal elements. When we calculate the determinant, we have two minus lambda, three minus lambda, minus zero when we do the product this way, we get zero, which gives us two and three for the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues of any upper triangular matrix are exactly the entries in the diagonal of the matrix. The same is true for any matrix that is lower triangular. Lower triangular matrices appear like this, non-zero stuff on the diagonal or below, and zero stuff above, or a diagonal matrix which has stuff that uh, lies on the diagonal and then zeros both below and above the main diagonal. I'd like to make a definition that will have an impact on our solution procedure for these homogeneous linear systems. And it goes like this. If K is the largest natural number, meaning that K is an element of blackboard bold N, such that lambda minus lambda naught to the power k is a factor of the characteristic polynomial of the matrix A We say that lambda naught is an eigenvalue of algebraic multiplicity k. So k is that highest power for which this factor appears as a factor of the characteristic polynomial. For example, if A is the matrix 3, 0, 0, 3, we already know that the eigenvalues appear on the diagonal, but clearly lambda equals 3, but with algebraic multiplicity equal to 2, because lambda minus 3 will appear as a root of the characteristic polynomial twice. In fact, the characteristic polynomial, polynomial is exactly lambda minus 3 quantity squared. The same can be said of the matrix A equals 3, 1, 0, 3. Lambda equals 3 with algebraic multiplicity equal to 2. The characteristic polynomials of these two different matrices are exactly the same. This one being upper triangular, this one being diagonal. You can see the eigenvalues directly on the diagonal itself. However, there is a distinction between these two matrices and their eigenvalues and eigenvectors that needs to be pointed out, and it leads to another definition. Down here, if we subtract three from the diagonal elements, in an attempt to find the eigenvectors, we only get this one constraint, y equals zero. 
which means our eigenvectors are of the form 1, 0 times an arbitrary constant. We only get one independent direction in the eigenspace as corresponding to lambda equals 3. That's different from the case above. In the case above, if we subtract 3 from the diagonal elements, we have no constraints on the eigenvectors at all. Every vector is an eigenvector. In particular, the eigenvectors generally will look like x, y, which can be expressed as x times 1, 0 plus y times 0, 1. In this case, we have two different eigendirections, 1, 0 and 0, 1, where in this case, there's only one independent eigendirection, 1, 0. And see, there's something distinctly different between this matrix and this matrix. When it comes to solving a homogeneous linear system with these two distinct matrices, the first matrix will generate two independent solutions, whereas the second matrix will only uh, generate one using eigenvectors and the eigenvalue lambda equals three. There's something missing about this second answer here, and this needs to be accounted for. We're led to the following definition The maximum number of linearly independent vectors in an eigenspace is called the geometric multiplicity. of the eigenvalue. You can see that for A equals 3003, the eigenvalue lambda equals 3 has algebraic multiplicity equal to the geometric multiplicity equal to 2 we had the characteristic equation lambda minus 3 squared, and we had 1, 0, and 0, 1 as independent directions in the eigenspace. That's in contravention to the matrix 3, 1, 0, 3, where lambda equals 3 has algebraic multiplicity equal to 2 because the characteristic equation was still lambda minus 3 quantity squared, but the eigenvectors only were uh, scalar multiples of 1, 0, and so it has geometric multiplicity equal to 1. It is a theorem from linear algebra that the geometric multiplicity of an eigenvalue is always less than or equal to the algebraic multiplicity. We're not going to prove this fact. We'll rely on your linear algebra course to prove it. We need to develop the terminology much like we did for second order uh, constant coefficient homogeneous ordinary differential equations. And in particular, we need to know what it means for these vector value functions to be linearly independent. We say that um, x1 x2 through xk are linearly independent if the only constants c1, c2 through ck such that c1 x1 plus c2 x2 plus ck xk 
equals zero, the zero vector, since we're adding vectors on an interval i, are all the coefficients equal to zero, the trivial linear combination. Let me give you an example. Suppose I have x1 equals e to the minus t to negative 5, and x2 equals e to the 6t, 1, 1. These are the solutions that we had from a matrix uh, 4251 earlier. Are these linearly independent? Well, let's find out. To be linearly independent means that c1x1 plus c2x2 is only zero when c1 and c2 are equal to zero. Let's see if that is an implication of what we have. This has to be true for all p in the solution interval, the solution interval being the entire little line. So this is going to be c1 times 2 times e to the minus t. I'll write it as c1 times negative 5 e to the minus t plus plus c2 e to the 6t c2 e to the 6 t. This equation equal to 0, 0 must be true for all t, and so in particular it has to be true for any particular t that we choose. So if we choose t equals 0, we get the system of equations 0, 0 equals 2c1 plus c2 negative 5c1 plus c2. This is equivalent to the linear system of equations 2c1 plus c2 equals 0, negative 5c1 plus c2 equals 0. Note that if you multiply the second equation by negative 1 and add, you end up with 7c1, and the c2s cancel out and gives you zero, which implies that c1 is zero. But if c1 is zero, that implies that c2 is also zero. From this, we deduce that these two are linearly independent. We need the following lemma. If V1, V2 through Vk are eigenvectors, with corresponding eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, through lambda k, such that lambda 1, lambda 2, through lambda k are all distinct. So these are pairwise different. Not one of them equals another one of them. Then the eigenvectors, v1, v2, through vk, are linearly independent. So eigenvectors coming from different eigenspaces are linearly independent and hence hook out in new directions. To prove this lemma, we're going to suppose that V1 through Vk are linearly dependent in some case, where the eigenvalues are distinct. And we're going to let J
to be the smallest element of the set 1, 2, through k, such that v1 through vj is linearly dependent. We know such a j exists because if we choose j equal to 1, the set containing only v1 will be linearly independent. So there has to be some j in between 1 and k where v1 through vj is still linearly dependent. Without loss of generality, w log is the acronym for without loss of generality, suppose cj is not 0 and 0 equals c1 v1 plus c2 c2 v2 and up to cj vj. We know at least one of these coefficients is non, can be non-zero because we're assuming linear dependence of the vectors v1 through vj. We can just rearrange the vectors if necessary to ensure that cj is the coefficient that is not zero. If we multiply this equation through by lambda j, we obtain this. But we can also multiply this equation through by the matrix A. If we multiply through by the matrix A, we can commute these scalars out to the front. And then note that each of these vectors, v1 through vj, is assumed to be an eigenvector with corresponding eigenvalue. We'll have c1 lambda 1 v1 plus c2 lambda 2 v2 on out to cj lambda j vj. If we now subtract this equation and this equation, we get the following. We have c1 that can be factored out on the first as well as the vector v1. We'll have c1 lambda j minus lambda minus lambda 1 v1 plus c2 lambda j minus lambda 2 v2 all the way out to the end. Notice the very last terms, this term and this term, exactly cancel out, which means you're only left with the second to last term. cj minus 1 times the quantity lambda j minus lambda j minus 1 times v j minus 1. Now, in the first equation, we've assumed that cj is not 0. One of these other c's must also be non-zero. Otherwise, that would imply that the vector vj is 0, but no eigenvector is equal to the 0 vector. So at least one of these other c's must be non-zero. So one of these other coefficients down here must be non-zero. Why? Note that lambda j minus lambda 1 isn't zero because lambda 1 and lambda j are distinct. Lambda 2 and lambda j are distinct, so this is not zero. And this is not zero. And at least one of these c's is also not zero, which means that the vectors v1, v2, through v j minus 1, these vectors are linearly dependent because we have a linear combination that's not trivial that adds up to the zero vector. This is a contradiction to an assumption that we've made. This leads to a contradiction. We assumed j was the smallest value. 
so that V1 through Vj was linearly dependent. But as a logical consequence, we've shown that there is yet a smaller value, so that these vectors are still linearly dependent. We deduce then that the original assumption that the vectors V1 through Vk are linear dependent is false. So we deduce that V1, V2, all the way down to Vk are linearly independent, not dependent, as we had supposed. This proof technique is a classic proof technique. We assumed the opposite of what we wanted to show. We assumed dependence and not independence. We arrived at a contradiction, two assertions that can't both be true at the same time. And therefore, the assumption that we made linear dependence must in fact be false, and the vectors are linearly independent. This is called proof by contradiction. It is also called, the proof method is called reductio ad absurdum. It follows very quickly then that if lambda 1 through lambda k are distinct eigenvalues, with, with corresponding eigenvectors v1 through vk, The functions x1 equals e to the lambda 1 t v1, x2 equals e to the lambda 2 t v2, xk equals e to the lambda k t v k are linearly independent solutions to the linear system x dot equals ax. The proof is very simple. Suppose 0 is c1 e to the lambda 1 t v1 plus ck e to the lambda k t v k like this. So we're going to suppose that for some c1 through ck, we'll set t equal to 0. If t is equal to 0, then we get 0 equals c1 v1 plus dot 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 ck vk. We already know that since v1 through vk come from different eigenspaces with these distinct eigenvalues lambda 1 through lambda k, that these coefficients must b0, because these vectors are linearly independent because of the last theorem. So we deduce that all of the C, Cs are 0, therefore x1 through xk, these functions are linearly independent, because the only linear combination that gives you the 0 vector is the one where all of the coefficients are zero, the trivial linear combination. This last theorem was nice. If you have distinct eigenvalues with the corresponding eigenvectors, you can construct linearly independent solutions. But it's too much to ask that we will always be dealing with distinct eigenvalues. We might have repeated eigenvalues and then vectors, different linearly independent vectors in the same eigenspace. In that case, we haven't proved linear independence. We need a tool for determining whether or not these solutions are linearly independent, just as we needed a tool 
when we were considering the nth order linear constant coefficient homogeneous ordinary differential equations. We need a Ronskian. So, the uh, Ronskian of x1, x2, xn for vector valued functions. Um, xj mapping some interval i into rn so we have n-dimensional vectors being output on some interval of, of values i is denoted by well we just use w or we might even put in these vector valued functions Notice we're assuming that they're n of them and they're outputting in n dimensional space. This is a key element. And we can even add in the functional dependence on t if we wish. And defined by, it's the determinant of the matrix that you get when you put these vectors down columns. Check it out. Suppose we have x1 is e to the minus t times 2, negative 5, and x2 is e to the 6t times 1, 1. The Ronskian is going to be 2 e to the minus t, negative 5 e to the minus t, e to the 6t, e to the 6t. That gives us 2 e to the 5t because you add the exponents and then you subtract a negative getting 5 e to the 5t and that is 7 e to the 5t. I'd like to show you that this new Ronskin exactly corresponds to an old Ronskin that we already have. Suppose we have y double prime plus 5y prime plus 6y equals zero. The characteristic equation is lambda squared plus five lambda plus six equals zero, which factors as what? Lambda plus two, lambda plus three. So we'll get lambda equals negative two and negative three, which gives us the general solution. C1 e to the negative two x plus C2 e to the minus three x. The old Ronskian would be e to the negative 2x, e to the negative 3x, negative 2 e to the negative 2x, negative 3 e to the negative 3x. You will recall that we had a method for converting these second order equations into first order systems. If we set w equal to y prime, then this is going to be w prime and this is going to be w. We'll move these two terms to the other side. We'll have the linear system y prime equals w and then w prime equals minus 6y minus 5w. If we set x equal to y w, which is also y y prime, then our equation becomes x prime equals the matrix 0, 1, negative 6, negative 5 times x. This is the matrix that, court, that we'll use for calculating eigenvalues and eigenvectors. To find the eigenvalues, We'll subtract lambda from the diagonal elements, and 
that gives us minus lambda times negative 5 minus lambda. You subtract the product this way, so we end up with minus a negative, or plus 6. Distributing, we'll have lambda squared. Minus minus is plus 5 lambda, and then plus 6. Note, that's exactly the characteristic equation that you would get from our second-order linear constant coefficient homogeneous case. Question now becomes, what are the eigenvectors? We have immediately, just as before, lambda equals negative 2 and negative 3. Now, what are the eigenvectors? For lambda equals minus 2, we subtract negative 2 from the diagonal elements. Notice we'll have negative 6. Subtracting negative 2 is like adding. Also notice that 3 times this row plus this row gives you 0. We didn't really have to write the second row. And we get an eigenvector 1, negative 2. For lambda equals negative 3, we'll subtract negative 3 or add 3 to the diagonal elements. And we'll get our eigenvector of 1, negative 3. This then gives us two solutions. Our solutions are e to the negative 2t, 1, negative 2, and e to the negative 3t, 1, negative 3. It follows that our Rontzkian is the determinant of e to the negative 2t, negative 2 e to the negative 2t, e to the negative 3t, negative 3 e to the negative 3t, and that's the same Ronskin we had before, because we have derivatives in the second row. You can see now that with regard to our linear systems, our new Ronskin obtained just by putting solutions down columns will give us all of the Ronskins from the previous theory. We can convert all of the previous theory into the new theory involving matrices, though the converse isn't necessarily quite so obvious. To see the usefulness of the new theory, let x1 through xn solutions to the linear system x dot equals ax, where I'm assume, assuming that the matrix A is n by n. Then these functions are linearly independent if and only if the Ronskin is not zero. The theorem is easy to prove. Suppose you have C1 X1 through Cn Xn equal to the zero vector. We can write this in a matrix form. The matrix X1 X2 through columns Xn times the vector c1, c2, through cn equals the zero vector. By a theorem from linear algebra, this homogeneous linear system has a unique solution, the zero vector, if and only if the determinant of the coefficient matrix is not zero. But the determinant of the coefficient matrix is the Ronskin. So this has only the uh, solution C1 equals C2 equals Cn as a solution if and only if the determinant of the coefficient matrix, i.e. the Ronskin, is not zero. This last there might leave you a little disconcerted. What if the Ronskin is zero for some t's and not zero for others? We're going to show that for solutions to these homogeneous linear systems, that never happens. But to do that, we need to build up a little machinery.
However, just as before, we need an Abel's lemma. Now, the trace of an n by n matrix A, which has entries A, I, J, I, J, it's denoted by the trace of A and defined by the trace of A is A11 plus A22 plus ANN, i.e. it's the sum of the diagonal elements of the matrix A. So for example, if I have the matrix A equals 4, 2, 5, 1, uh, 4, 5, 5, 1, then the trace of A is going to be 4 plus 1, which is 5. It is a theorem from linear algebra that the trace of a matrix is the sum of the eigenvalues of A, including multiplicities. So for example, if A is the matrix 3103, the trace is equal to this, is equal to six, whereas these eigenvalues, lambda equals three, as algebraic multiplicity equal to two. So you get three plus three equals six.